It is the story that transfixed America. An all-American star athlete turned movie star, his beautiful wife, two brutal murders, and a collision of crime, celebrity, policing, and race that obsessed millions and exposed America's racial divide. Everybody, and I mean everybody, knew O.J. Simpson. If you didn't know him as a Hall of Fame running back, you knew him from commercials. You knew him from movies like The Naked Gun, but the story turned into a nightmare on June 12, 1994, when his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ronald Goldman, were brutally murdered outside of her condo. O.J. Simpson was charged with two counts of murder. Then came the infamous, hours-long slow-motion chase in that white Bronco. You know, 96 million people were watching it live. I understand we, we're going to go to a live picture in Los Angeles. Police believe that, that O.J. Simpson is in that car. Okay. Police believe he is in that vehicle. You know, Simpson eventually is surrendering and pleading not guilty. Absolutely 100% not guilty. Must see TV with shocking moments like this. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Well, you know, 11 months later, a jury did exactly that. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. The verdict dividing America along racial lines in a split screen that, frankly, could not be ignored. 13 years later, O.J. Simpson would go on to prison, but not for the murders. He was convicted of robbery and served nine years. His family says that he died at his home in Las Vegas at the age of 76 after a battle with cancer. But let's not lose sight of what this is all about. Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman, two people who were brutally murdered, leaving their loved ones, including children, grieving to this day. The Goldman family speaking out tonight, saying the news of Ron's killer passing away is a mixed bag of complicated emotions and reminds us that the journey through grief is not linear. Well, our first guest knew Nicole Brown Simpson and O.J. He was living in a guest house on O.J. Simpson's property at the time of the murders. Cato Kalin was a key witness for the prosecution in O.J. Simpson's murder trial, and Cato Kalin joins me now. Cato Kalin, thank you for joining us tonight. I mean, it has been an extraordinary day to contemplate and look back to that time, which I'm sure feels very fresh to you. When you think back Laura, to that time... You, you... Oh, go ahead. Excuse me. I was, I was going to say, listening to you and, and, and seeing everything that just came up, it encapsulates this last 30 years. And I, I sat here and I relived everything that you had just said. And uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, I'm older now. And when, when people say uh, time goes by in, in a wink of an eye, and you're a kid, you don't think that, but it does. And I, all the stuff that has happened, and, uh, and today, this morning, getting about 99 messages immediately and coming into 300 messages. So I knew immediately that it meant someone had died. And, and that's how I was, uh, I found out about all this. And I, I gotta tell you that um, uh, it was because I had so many calls that came in, I decided to sit down. I didn't want to do anything, but I decided to sit down and to write something uh, from the heart. And that's why I posted something on social media. And it's, uh, it is condolences to the kids of OJ of of Arnell and Jason and Sydney and Justin, uh, because uh, you know, losing a father is never easy, but my heart goes out to Fred Goldman and Kim, losing a son and a brother. And uh, all, all, I don't know if it brings closure. I doubt after hearing that, because they have to live through it every day. And of course, for Nicole Brown Simpson, the beautiful, who was this beacon of light, who always was bright and shining. And I, I really stress, Laura, that people don't forget, it's really about those two human beings that lost their lives in their prime. You know, Cato, when you were reliving it, even through our brief introduction to this conversation, where does your mind go? What does it feel like? Take us back to then. 
you know, I, I went back to the, the actual of living at the estate. I, I, everything that I'm listening, I'm, because it's so, it, it's not on my mind anymore, but it's in the forefront now of thinking of, of uh, inviting myself, for instance, to that drive to McDonald's, which I didn't know was McDonald's. And I thought about that, of uh, I invite myself, but I could tell he didn't want me to go. And that's, it becomes the most important timeline in, in, the, in the trial. And because of these sort of things that happened 30 years ago, still to this day, I mark down everything I ever do. If uh, I, I'm married now, but I always make sure of where I was at this moment. I write down the time, what song I heard on the radio, just because I'm so aware of timelines that it's become so much a part of my life. And um, I, I think back of um, the invite. I think back of seeing the, the, the uh, Justin and Sydney growing up and laughing. So it's all these mixed emotions. It's like a, a videotape machine playing back all these memories. You've said in the past that you think that he was guilty. Was there a time you doubted that? In the very beginning, I doubted it because I thought that he, he flew to Chicago. He, uh, there's no possible way. Uh, even when f uh, four detectives came to my guest room, I didn't know what was going on. I just let these four guys in. They didn't say they were the police yet until they told me, and then they asked me what I was wearing. They, they walked around the room. They looked at the bottom of my shoes, and I said, did his plane crash? But nothing made sense. It was a, it was a, a fog. And then with time passing and, and more and more that would come out, uh, I changed my mind that I, he, I, he's a guilty man, I believe. Did you think there would be a time when you would speak with him and he would tell you that? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, there was a time though, it's a great question, Laura, and uh, I remember a time where my mind was swayed when he, uh, after the murders, he, he brought me into the kitchen while there was people there uh, having dinners and consoling, and he just said to me, you, you remember we ate, we ate our, our food in the kitchen? And I, I remember completely that was such a lie that he, when we came back to McDonald's, he was at, the, uh, at his door of the car, and I was 20 yards away walking into his house going to go in there and then he I looked that he wasn't there and I said oh he doesn't want to be around me and that was the last and that started the whole timeline uh, so I knew that was a big lie and I didn't know why I was lying you know I've always wondered I remember watching your testimony and your name frankly became a household name people knew who you were it was such a high profile trial it went on for months everyone associated yeah. you with it I have always wondered um, what this trial meant to your life and and going forward you know, Laura, it's, it's, I came out from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to become an actor. I became famous for all the wrong reasons. I became uh, in, in worldwide famous, and it's something I always wish for, but I, I know it came for the wrong reasons that two people lost their life. I'm aware of that, and I can't change anything in the past. I, I really, everything I do is for the present and the future, and so I always try to just not look back at dark and always look at light and, and to always pay it forward. Because that, that was my blueprint that I was going to be involved. There's, there's nothing I can change, but I can make everything so much better in my life. And I hated that in the beginning. The court of public opinion that came out in the beginning just called me every sort of name that I knew wasn't true from a, a liar, a freeloader, a dummy, um, a pariah, even an assassin's target. And I was none of those things, but I couldn't change the court of public opinion yet. And it took so much time, Laura, to make sure that all those things that that really affected me and, and I, hurt me as a person and my family, that I know I would overcome them. And I think it, it took almost 30 years, but I think everything came out now. And I, I sure am a better por person for it. And I really think that I... I paid it forward, and I tried to always make other people better. And it's because of my, my late parents always saying, make the other person better. And I live by that motto, and, uh, and that's, I, I believe that's, it's true. It's come to fruition that I've become uh, bringing the light. Well, that's a beautiful sentiment that your parents have instilled in you, and I thank you for, for joining us. I, just one more question for you. And I, did you ever stay in touch with him after this trial? 
No, I, I never stayed in touch with any with anybody really. I mean, I had some uh, Facebook mm -hmm. messages from Tanya. I did Kim Goldman's podcast, but no, because I really, really believe that that was such a dark period that everybody mm -hmm. had to grow, and so I didn't want to uh, any more growing. But I did see him in a deposition after the first break, an hour and a half. I said some many uh, true things that were derogatory, and we ended up in the men's rooms uh, together. And I was scared out of my mind, so I walked out, and that was the last contact. And he just said, hey, what's up, after I had just been uh, taking a deposition on him. Wow. Kato Kalin, thank you so much for joining us. Laura, thank you so much, and thank you for your time. It means a lot. Thank you.